Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's about time to start the secondary plenary talk for today. Ah, this is a written one. <laughs> okay. It is my uh, great, uh, great honor to introduce the speaker, uh, Professor Ilana Shoami. Uh, professor Shoami is currently a professor of language education in the School of uh, Education at Tel Aviv University in Israel, where she teaches courses in uh, language testing, assessment, uh, critical language testing, language policy, uh, immigration and multilingualism issues, and language in public space or uh, linguistic landscaping. Her major teaching and research areas, as nicely summed up in a bio data in the program book, have been largely focused upon the issue of coexistence and language right in multilingual societies, uh, which are also inseparable from the core issues of language testing, language policy, migration, and linguistic uh, landscape. Professor Shohami is the author, co-author of more than 100 journal articles and book chapters, if I'm, if I'm right. <laughs> and uh, author, co-author, editor, co-editor of about a dozen um, books. If I mention a few of the volumes, uh, they will include the power of test, published in 2001 uh, with Harlow, and the language policy in 2006, and lang ling linguistic landscape in 2009, and also volume seven of language testing and assessment of the Encyclopedia of Language Education, uh, published through Springer in 2009. Uh, Professor Shoami also served as an editor of a journal language policy between 2007 and 2015, and is currently editor of the new journal Linguistic uh, Landscape. If my memory is correct, I first uh, met uh, Professor Shohami and came to know her uh, by attending language testing research colloquium uh, conferences uh, over the past 20 year period. And she is one of the founding parents of LTLC that started in 1979 and was served as president of International Language Testing Association uh, in 1999 and in 2010 in recognition of her valuable work on critical language testing, ILTA awarded her the ILTA Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, the title of our talk is, is today is Social, Political, Economic Ideologies of English. What is the cost and who are the victims? Uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Ilana Shwami with a big and warm round of applause. Thank you also for inviting me. It's actually compared to Bill and to um, Patsy, I'm new here actually. I was here once before, but I've never given a talk to any of my colleagues here in Korea. And it's a great honor to be here. I've heard so much about Korea. I had students over the years and really am happy to be here and learn more about Korea and I hope one day, for those of you who haven't been to Israel, you'll come in to Israel and visit us, and you'll see that there are very many similarities. Also, countries with ha which have, so to speak, small languages, languages not so small, but still concentrated in one place, plus diasporas, of course, languages that we in Israel actually were uh, Hebrew had been a language that had not been used for 2,000 years as a spoken language, although there were written, there was written, uh, Hebrew was written, and now Hebrew is a natural language for almost all in the country, and it's the most dominant language for the good of the, and the bad sometimes, because sometimes what happens with new languages is that they swallow all the other languages. And in Israel, most of the people who came to Israel, besides the Arabs who've been there before, are newcomers who came from all countries around the world. So they came to Israel with lots and lots of languages. None of them was Hebrew. Some people, usually men, knew how to read and write Hebrew, but they didn't know how to speak Hebrew. 
So beginning at the, 19th, the end of the 19th century, people started moving to Palestine at the time and started using, uh, they spoke various, many languages from their hometown, from their home countries, territorial languages. And one of the main ideologies of, he, of, of, of creating a new nation in a new space was to find a common language that will suit all people. And it's very interesting because Jewish languages like Yiddish, you may have heard of Yiddish, has been a language around, used in many places in Eastern Europe or other areas or people who spoke Ladino, another Spanish variety of a Jewish language and many Jewish languages. And when Hebrew had been revived at the beginning of the 20th century with a planning committee, with groups that were ideological about it, and if you didn't speak Hebrew, you, they were kind of uh, um, uh, ignore you. It was almost like my grandparents spoke Yiddish and in a way they were kind of marginalized in the society because they didn't speak Hebrew. Luckily my grandfather learned Hebrew, was easier for him because he could speak, he could read Hebrew. Men usually knew how to read. My grandmother didn't know how to read. So when she came to Israel, she continued speaking Yiddish and never actually acquired Hebrew. As a result, she was marginalized in the society because she didn't speak the ideological language. And many people had it very difficult to learn Hebrew, a new language. And all of a sudden, that you are supposed to learn it in school, you're supposed to use it in the streets with your parents, even at home. They even had tests at home for people to check that they're actually speaking Hebrew. But they didn't know Hebrew. How could they speak Hebrew? So the situation has been very ideological in terms of language, and Hebrew had been forced on many people, while many other people really wanted to learn it. And the idea behind it was, if we have one language which is the same for all, the country will be united and we will have collective, strong collective identity. Israel is a very split country today, politically, economically, and so on, although we have one language. So what we see here is that Hebrew is not a guarantee. One language for all is not a guarantee for unification or for a feeling of we all are the same or we all think the same. But still, I must say, it's a major achievement, probably the only one in, 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 the, in history, a language that had been totally ignored and totally not spoken, and all of a sudden, it's a language that becomes everybody's language. Let alone their victims along the way, people who spoke Arabic, didn't know it because they were there before, they didn't speak Hebrew. They still speak Arabic and learn in Arabic, but to a large extent they have speaking Hebrew because all universities in Israel teach in Hebrew and in English. So there comes English, the language of a mandate, because from 1917 to 1949, only, I mean, the British were there till 1948, sorry. The British mandate was there. So the British mandate spoke English, used English, and they gave independence to each one of the groups, Arabs and Jews, to speak their languages. So for Arabs, they could speak and study in Arabic. For Jews, which now make up the majority of the country, 80%, and the most dominant language group, they speak Hebrew. And it's very interesting that already in 1923, Hebrew was recognized by the British as an official language in Palestine. And once, after, they, after the British have left, Israel removed, Arab, removed English as an official language because the attitude to the British was so negative because they were the occupiers, the conquerors. So in 1950, almost English was taboo. They didn't want to hear it. My parents came from the US and it was an embarrassment to speak English in 1950. And once the 1960s and 70s and so on, and the relationship with the US strengthened, English became a major language like it is a global language everywhere else. But what's so interesting is that although Arabic is official language in Israel. You, don't, you won't be able to tell that it's official because many of the signs around the country are not in Arabic. 
Some of the, you won't see the names of stores in Arabic in most Jewish areas, only in Arab towns. And English, which is not official at all, is actually to be found everywhere, almost like here. We take lots of pictures. One of the things I do, and I'll mention it today, is what's called linguistic landscape. And that's an area we've been working with a lot of, for, since for 10 years now, and where we document public spaces, which languages appear in public spaces linguistic landscape. So what we see is officiality doesn't really mean much. English is not official, but it's everywhere. Arabic is official, but it's almost nowhere. So we're doing lots and lots of research on that. So as of now, Hebrew and Arabic are official languages with very different status. And in 1999, there was a Supreme Court decision that said that at least Arabic should appear in all cities which have Hebrew, Arab, Jews and Arabs together, or in the same town, what's called mixed towns. So all the street names are in Arabic, Hebrew, and English. So he, he, Arabic had been introduced, it's there, but it's actually only in these very places where the Supreme Court said they should be Arabic. So this is the situation. English, like here, is a very, very dominant language in many ways. People, st children study English from first grade, and it's to be found in many places. Although, and this is probably different, or correct me if I'm wrong, there is a very big competition between Hebrew and English. People who are ideologues, who really revived Hebrew, are constantly f in fear that Hebrew will disappear. That the big language, a la Deswan, the big language Hebrew, uh, English, will swallow Hebrew. And then what will happen with the big achievements of reviving Hebrew? So there is constantly a fear, and we have an academy of Hebrew language that constantly imposes Hebrew everywhere and constantly says too much English is used everywhere. So there is this competition and tension with English. So it's not something that everybody sees as favorably. Many people think this is a danger to see English. At the same time, there is the reality. English is everywhere and English has to be learned and kids learn it and people want to learn it and so on and so on. But what I want to show you also is that there are lots of victims of English. And these are the people who cannot make it well in, in, in learning English. And this is what I will concentrate a bit on. And these are, for example, immigrants who come into Israel, and I know there are lots of immigrants to, to Korea now too. For them, it's a third language, because when they come to Israel, they have to learn the first language, I mean, they come with the first language, let's say Russian, then they have to learn Hebrew, which is the national language, and then they have to learn English, and it's also important because it's a language of academia, in other words, all the articles students read are always in English. They, the classes are being held in Hebrew. So for an Arab student who studied all in Arabic to come to the university, it's difficult. For the immigrant, the same way. They have to learn Hebrew and they also have to acquire English. Obviously, they don't do as well as the native speakers. And in my view, they are some of the victims of English. And I'm very much focusing on the victims of English. And I think that Patsy mentioned a lot of uh, dimensions of the victimization of English. And I will want to kind of say some things about that. So let me begin by, by talking about uh, those topics, and I hope I gave you the background to see where there are the similarities and where are the differences. But I think we are still dealing with a situation where we need those two languages, local and, and global. And now we are looking into a new language policy. I was just funded with a colleague of mine in Tel Aviv University to introduce a new language policy in Israel. And the new language policy in Israel is multilingual policy for all Israeli schools. That means much beyond English and Hebrew, but towards a variety of other languages, as well as mixing of languages within classes. So if you learned history, you can use it in Hebrew, you can use English, you can use Latin or whatever other language is appropriate. And we want to 
be in a situation where Israeli children can learn at least three or four languages. This is true both to Arabs and to Jews. And this process, we just started on March 1st, and hopefully next time I come here, if I'll be invited again, depends on my talk, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'll be, be able to report to you about this new experiment that we are running. Okay, so let me say some things to begin with. So, English ideologies in general, I think there's nothing new here about the current and dominant global lingua franca, which is greatly appreciated. As a result, there is strong emphasis on its advantages. People usually talk about it, their advantages, and, compulsory, and it's compulsory in most educational systems in the world. Even in countries that don't like America, or they don't like Britain, still they realize that that America is, English is no longer the language of America or the language of Britain or Australia, but it's the language of the world and we better know it. For how long? We don't know. If I judge it by the number of students who are learning Chinese in Israel alone, it's like amazing and it's growing by, the, by, by so fast, exponentially. So who knows what will happen soon and who knows what the current regimes in certain countries will bring about. Okay, no, more, no need for more elaboration, right? Most research on learning English adapts what we call, what, what Passy said too, a neoliberal perspective whereby success in English has become the sole criteria for academic and financial success. And this is what the situation today is. You know, English, you have it made. Yet, this policy overlooks the cost of learning English to a large portion of the population who cannot reach this goal in schools and learn it for high cost privately. And we see it here, we see it in Israel as well. Many of the children learn it privately. The school is not doing the job, or the school cannot do the job, and I'll explain in a minute why. Okay, those are the victims, what I call the victims of English language worldwide. They include those who cannot afford to learn English privately, they don't have the money for that. And minorities and immigrants, as I mentioned, minority, minorities like the Arabs and others in Israel, and immigrants here as well, for whom English is a third language, as they always lag behind, having to learn both Korean, in this case, and English. In Israel, Arabs and immigrants. This paper is anchored in what I call critical language policy and critical language testing. And the 2006 is critical language policy, which is the, the book I wrote about policy, and 2001 is the book I wrote on the power of tests that was just mentioned. It points to the victims of English in Korea and elsewhere, where English is a gatekeeper to higher education and the workplace. I, I, conclude with, I concluded with, I conclu it concludes with proposal for alternative English language policies suitable for minimizing this phenomenon. So the social dimensions of English, the critical theories, raises questions about policy, testing, and learning. And for those of you who are looking for one clear definition about critical theories in language and pedagogy, the main question, thing is question it. Ask something about it. Let me for a minute show you where I question something, which is, remember the development, which I mentioned at the beginning, the development of Hebrew from a no language to a power language in Israel. This is like a major phenomena. I don't accept the phenomena as is. What, most of my work is about questioning those phenomena. What did the the development of Hebrew is a fantastic language, some call it a miracle, due to individual people. What did it do to my grandmother who couldn't walk in the street? What did it do to my, grandf to my father who couldn't find a job? Because if we didn't have, have no Hebrew, you couldn't find a job. What happens to the Arab students who come to my, who comes to my class at the university and wants to study in Arabic? This is what he was, medium of instruction was in his school, in my class. He doesn't understand as well as some of the others. What happened to people? 
people who had to leave the country because they couldn't find, they couldn't get accepted to universities because all of a sudden a new language became the major language and other people who didn't know the language, especially people who are older and couldn't, was too late to learn the language, what did it do to them? So most of my work in the Hebrew revival, and not everybody likes my work usually, is that I'm very critical about why Hebrew had to be developed without giving any respect to the languages that people came with. Like, my, my father spoke Polish or English. How come nobody gave any respect? The only way was, do you know English? Do you know Hebrew? Or here, like, do you know English? What happens to the other, what happens to Korean in this situation here? I'm very concerned about the languages that got lost. And Professor Spolsky, that many of you here know him, because I know he's been to Korea many times, Professor Spolsky and myself wrote a book, actually, an article about Beyond, which is called The, the Cost of Reviving a Language. It's not just a miracle, but somebody always pays the cost, and usually it's people. So English creates a social and economic divide, Patsy, also divide, you see. <laughs> so English is a powerful and imposing language. Is, is the, and English is, okay, English is a powerful and imposing. English is the sole indicator of success and access to the job market. English enables or disables entrance, mobility, and movement, successful academic degrees, class and financial benefits. Native variety is still the criteria for good English. And the testers, I'm one of those, are at blame. English is, experience, is expensive to acquire out of school. English marginalizes people and other languages. And this is where I'm talking about the price of multilingualism. The emphasis is so strong on English. What about the other languages? English creates winners and losers. English prevents opportunities and possibilities, creates inequalities and social justi justice and injustice, especially of immigrants and minority groups. English introduces marginalization, discrimination, and ethical issues. What are the sources, the causes of that? One, I would say, it's mismatching between the policy and practices for L2, English is an L2, and L3. I'll, mention, I'll talk about that in a minute. Overlooking L1 in content learning, and three, linguistic landscape, language, and public space. And I'll talk about these. So what do I mean by mismatching of policy and practices for L2 and L3? And I'm coming here to Bill's talk yesterday about the issue of top-down versus bottom-up. So, language policy and language tests are based on ideologies. What is language policy? And I've worked a lot in language policy. I've edited the journal for eight years on language policy. And one of the things with language policy that it's to a large extent based on ideologies. What, I would, what the nation would like to see. In Colombia, where I also work at times, people want all people, I mean the government wanted all um, Colombians to know English proficiently that bilingual Colombia by 2014, which is like a few years ago already. Now here, it's a, what is policy mostly is wishful thinking, but it doesn't touch any, is it feasible? Is it something that can really happen? Just because I want something to be, had to happen, and I want peace. So what if I want peace? Doesn't mean that the conditions are there to get there. So ideologies, wishful thinking, without examining the feasibility in reality. Like how many years does it take to learn a language? How many hours does it take to acquire English for L2 or L3s? L3s are always those who are the immigrants and the minority groups. So how many, we don't know, but these decisions are being made up. I myself, with Professor Spolsky and another team, worked on language policy for Israel in 1996. Nobody asked us whether it's feasible. The government only wanted to know what they wanted to get but never ever ask whether it's even feasible to want this thing. So this is one of the, I'm very, very critical of language policy. It's not that I think that language policy, and I think that's what we heard yesterday from you as well. So, for example, this is a study I've done a few years ago, and one of the things they found that for immigrants coming to Israel, for example here, 
We found that student, this is like, um, uh, uh, here is the Israeli students, and these are the Ethiopian students, you see. And this is the, uh, the red one is the um, Russian students. So let's look at the Russians here in the red. And we could see after zero to two years, they're about here. Then they go up, they're getting closer to the native speakers. They go up to three to four years, five to six years, se uh, what is it, six to, s six to seven, nine to 10, and 11 to 12. Only here they manage in Hebrew to get a bit beyond the line. And we are talking about Russian students who are very, come with very high SES, socioeconomic status. So how many years it takes? It takes nine years for an immigrant, a Russian immigrant, what happened to this? Oh, here. Nine, nine years to become a bit better than, the, and it wasn't even significant at this level. So how many years does it take for somebody to acquire the language? This is academic language. Nine to ten years. So it's a very long time to come and study the subjects in the language, the new language. Now talk about the Ethiopia. Oh, sorry. I did something wrong. Wait. I want to go back. Okay. Okay, now look at, let's look for a minute on the uh, Ethiopians. The Ethiopians come from very low literacy skills. So for them, which is a large number of immigrants to Israel, look, they actually never, never reach it. Why is this so low? Because here, these are students who came like 12 years ago and they didn't get any help at the time. And these at least get some help so they make it progress, but still, it takes two or three generations before they will become like the native speaker who are born into Hebrew. So here, this, now, how, now, if we look at mathematics, it's even worse, you see, like the Ethiopians are doing even worse. No, no, adva no progress, hardly at all. The uh, Russians are doing progress and they come with high level of mathematics before from Russia, from the former Soviet Union, and eventually after 12 years. So it takes a long time. And my question is this, to what extent, to what extent second language learners continue to rely on their L1 and all their lives? We'll see it in a minute. Yet L1 is ignored and overlooked. But usually students, immigrant students, get one year of help. This is the policy. Sometimes even four years if they're Ethiopians. But it takes nine to ten years. So how do we, we match the policy and the reality? They don't match. But policies exist. Okay. Now, test and policies demand that English learners achieve native proficiency in their L2 and are penalized if they don't. It's a fantasy, I call it. They are always compared to native users of English. Is it even possible that they will be like native, language, native speaker or close to native? It's not possible. I was born in the US. I, I was born in a family that spoke only English at home. I was born in the US. I was five when I moved to Israel. My parents spoke English at home. I studied English in school. I'm still far away from a native. And I lived in America for 15 years. And all the good, I'm not a native and I will not be a native. Because people always ask me, where are you from? I always get this question. What do you mean, me? I was born, you spoke English and everything. I am not there yet and I won't be there. I better acknowledge it and know that I will never be there. Don't give me tests that are based on people for whom L2 is the la English is the native speaker. None of us will be like them and we don't want to be like them now. Now we know, we won't get it. Why should I want to even be, get to somewhere? But the policy will tell me this is where you want me to. But L2 English learners will never be like natives. Even worse is the situation with immigrants for whom English is L3. Minorities and second language learners continue to employ their L1 in academic function, functioning all but but, the, but all the time, but these are being ignored. It's reality. We don't give any credit whatsoever to the languages they know. Arabs come to the university or to school, nobody gives attention to Arabic. Russian students or Ethiopians come to the university, this language is ignored. Nothing is happening with that language. What a pity. 
Okay, can we afford to suppress what they know and use over a lifetime for the sake of national ideologies? That's my open question. Ample research shows that L3 students lag behind, or lag, sorry, lag behind when they are obligated to learn English in addition to their home and national language, resulting in lower scores as they are compared to the majority students, I already said that, for whom it is L2 and not L3. Policy, this is the policy, but it's a bad reality. So I'm looking at reality and reality and ideology. Arabs for whom Arab, in, in the, we have a number of studies, not just one, maybe 15 or 20 studies that show Arabs for whom Arabic is the first language do poorly in English and hence, oh, oh it's also touch, you know. <laughs> wait, 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 sorry. <laughs> I'm a Mac, Mac doesn't have the touch yet. <laughs> so I have to go back and um, mm, this is back, no, this is back. No, this is bad. Okay, here, this is the research in Israel. Okay, so Arabs for whom Arabic is the first language always lag behind. Immigrants with different home language do poorly in English in schools. For both groups, English is L3, but they are compared to those with whom English is L2. So you see this national, national scores around the country. We have matriculation examinations at the end of 12th grade. What do we always see? Everyone who is an Arab, everyone who is an immigrant will do poorly on English, obviously. Why do we give them the same test? Why do we give them the same criteria? While for them it's a third language, for others it's a second. I've already said it many times. Okay, let me show you one other experiment that we've had over the years. And we show that students that look, to, look at the two lines. You see, st these are students who, who, who got the ma mathematic test in Hebrew and Russian. These are Russian students. They got the same test in Hebrew and Russian. Each question was written in Arabic, in Hebrew, and in Russian. Those students, the lower level, got only the test only in Hebrew. Look what happens. Those who got it in two languages, their L1 and their L2 Hebrew, got consistently better even after 12 years up to here. So what it shows us, and we're doing many more studies now, and I'm not the only one, people are showing that L1 goes with us for a long time. And oftentimes we don't know certain vocabulary in L1, and the fact that we have the L2 and the L1 gives us better score in math and other subjects as well. In history, we've had another study. We also had a study just presented a few weeks ago showing that when we gave students a control group, the experimental group, two languages, to test the questions in history in two languages, their home language and their new language, versus a group that got it only in the new language, always consistently students said, we enjoyed it much better, we, can answer, we could answer the history so much better. So we show from one experiment after another that L1 must be included. Because L1 provides something that we don't find yet in L2. Think about even a word like mosquito. A word mosquito, nobody talks in school in mosquitoes. But in Russian at home, probably you did see the word mosquito. So you are able to put more meaning into the question, and therefore you get a better score in history or in math. So this is a model, and we're going to enlarge this kind of research. Or just to make it something that you'll remember even better, is the fact that we take people who have one eye and we may tell them, close your eye, your good eye, which is Russian, Arabic, or whatever language, Chinese and Korea, let's say. Can we force language users to close one eye when we see better with two? I'm sure you'll remember this picture. <laughs> Okay, so questions. Do our tests reflect by multilingual uses of language in this day and age in the context of plural linguist societies? Do we set realistic goals in terms of levels of proficiency, dynamic and fluid nature of language? We don't. We still separate. All our tests are in English only and only in English as if there's no other language that the students know. It's bad.
Are we ethical when we design tests based on definition and goals provided by central agencies? Because the central agencies, like the government, they want to know what the score is in English. But I'm saying their English is also a function of their Korean or of their Hebrew. Do we open our tests to be monitored by society, critiqued and sanctioned? The government decides what they want to do. We are not really part of that. Conclusion, the need to identify tests that assess L2 or L3 or three languages together incorporate L1 into the L2 curriculum. We have to do that. Translanguaging, translanguage is allowing a number of languages. I could have shown you one of, this, one of the compositions I always use, whereby you see a student has to write a recipe and the person uses Hebrew and English together. And when they use English and Hebrew together, you get the perfect recipe. If I only put it in English, you won't get it. So in other words, we constantly, and you see it here too, we use two languages. Elf, English lingua franca, English, fra English lingua franca, if you like it or not, it's very popular in Asia. In, in Asia. English lingua franca means that the native, the non -native does not speak like the non-native. And Ellen Bialystok says the brain of the native and the non-natives are very different. They use different features in order to get, why do we give them the same tests? So translanguage, even CEFR now, which is totally monolingual in each language separately, is introducing in August a mediation form. A mediation where you can also bring your L1 into the, 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 the testing situation. Program need to be based on reality, research, rather than ideologies. How many years does it take to learn the language? It, makes many, it takes many years to acquire, not possible to reach native-like proficiency, make the programs based on reality, no pure English, but rather mixed with L1 and in content areas. I know that many of the teachers here in, in, in Asia are uh, everywhere in Japan, in Hong Kong, are native speakers of English. You'll ask, how can they introduce Korean into their classroom? And I can tell you that in many, we have some bilingual programs in Israel where you have bilingual Hebrew Arabic in Israel. You have one teacher of Arabic, one teacher of, of, of Hebrew. They are in the same classroom. One person emphasizes the Korean call it or the Arabic, one person, what the other teacher emphasizes the other language. In other words, two teachers in the classroom allow this kind of situation. And I think this is something that we should really think of as a model so we won't ignore what we already know in our L1. And multilingual language policy in Israeli schools, I mentioned it already, but I'll tell you, I can tell you more about it. English within various subjects, we're trying to introduce, when you learn history, you have to look for text in English, although it's in Korean in class, or, or other languages. Multilingual tests, as you could see with this example I showed you before, and people are working all around, I would say, even in ETS on multilingual tests now, where you can show what we call the full language repertoire. The language, the language you know, the language proficiency you know in a number of languages together. Learning from the ecology, that's my new thing and for the past 10 years, which is linguistic landscape. And I want to show you that there's so much language around us and the language you see around us is so mixed. It's English and Korean. It's or even the same. It's not, sometimes it's not exactly the same, but it's on the same sign. It's only in public space that we are allowed to mix languages. So here, for example, you see this kind of. These are typical signs. Go study signs. You'll see how multilingual they are. How what kind of English is being used, and it's all around us. My little granddaughters learn how to read from the signs, from public signs. You just walk in the streets and we do it with students now. We walk around the public spaces and we learn how to read from the public spaces. And it's something students love. They take their little cameras, iPhones, whatever, and they document the public spaces. They look at variety of languages, how the languages in the public space is not exactly the same. We've just given a very nice symposium in, the, in um, in ISB, in the International Society of Bilingualism in Ireland, about connecting the ecology with the classroom, the classroom with the ecology. 
In other words, each one can learn from the other. And here you can see um, here a number of languages. All you see English and Hebrew star together. And there's so many, I've taken so many pictures in Korean and English everywhere. Unfortunately, I don't know Korean, so I need somebody to help me with that. Here you see three languages. You see Hebrew on top, Arabic in the middle, English on the bottom. Here you see English. This is typical, and this is what you see here in Korea too, in Seoul. Here again, Arabic and whatever. The John Pope, uh, Pope John Paul came. There was only English and Arabic, and no Hebrew because Jews are not supposed to know about the Pope, right? <laughs> And the little Alma, who is learning how to read in public space, and it's really what we call the tip of the iceberg, because in the public space you see just little words such as, this word says, please free conscientious objectors. Now, what does a kid, she was six years old, then know about conscientious objectors in war? So she asked, what does it mean, conscientious objectors, in Hebrew? And I have to explain to her what is a war, why do people don't agree about war? Why some people don't want to go to fight in the war? And then just next to it, there is the word uh, law, which means no. And here she says, oh, so why is there a no here? I said, because some people agree, some people don't agree. Then she asked, why do they agree? Why they don't agree? And so on. So we like to call linguistic landscape a tip of the iceberg, but it's really an opening of knowledge of society in a very deep way, and there's so much more to say about it. Okay, the need to think differently about English, not as a single language, but as language embedded in a broader context at the workplace, at school, in the ecology. In the same way that we see English and Korean in the public spaces, we should introduce these in schools. Something that is very important, and also it has to do with Bill of yesterday, engaged language policy by Kathy Davis in 2014. A whole approach to, to language policy today is not through top-down in that way, but in that special issue of language policy, Kathy Davis talks about, think of language policy by involving schools, principals, and students, and create policies that match their needs and visions. And avoid test as the only criteria for success, which he also mentioned yesterday. These types of recommendations are true, not only to the victims of English, but to all students. And one of the things that I wanted to say is like with this new project, one of the things that we are going to do with this new multilingual project in Israeli schools is that we will not decide about the policy. And the nation will not decide on the policy. But we will have schools decide about the policy. And what we're trying, the schools with the board, with the principals, with the students, with the parents, they will make decisions about the policy. Maybe not on major language, Hebrew, English, but about all the rest of the language which we want to be representative of the group that actually, uh, let's say, group where you have um, uh, asylum seekers. They are interested in Amharic, they are interested in Tagala, they are interested in other languages, and we would like to bring those languages into the schools, because we don't want a situation of a nation that speaks the same language. And you know, I don't know if it happens here, we have so many people who are objecting to English. Like there are people um, who come from Middle Eastern background, Jews even, who said, I don't want, for me English is so difficult that like like Patsy said before, from day one I see myself as a victim. And the CFR, which I know is being used here in, in Korea, right? No? Okay. No, okay. This is what we were told, okay. So, so the CFR, for example, which has A1, A2, maybe you don't call it CFR, you call it another name, C1, A1, A2, B1, B2, which is big in the European framework, in other words. The European framework actually, one of the studies we have is that it shows that if you get to be, let's say, an A2, it's almost impossible for you to get rid of this level of A2. 
It's like you accept this as your identity. It's exactly what you said. And you can see it like very early age already. You, you are a low level student. And for years and years, you don't, you're not able to overcome this low level and high level as well. So I think the whole idea that we create some kind of scales like this early age is really problematic. And I think, therefore, we have to come up with tests which are much more flexible and allow movements. And as Bill mentioned yesterday, maybe it's portfolios, maybe it's projects. We find other things. I don't know about you, but I don't give my students tests anymore in the university. Why do we give school students in school those multiple choice tests? Okay, this is all I had to say, and there's much more, of course, and I want to thank you, Toda is thank you, and in Israel we also always say, uh, okay, it disappeared again, but we always say, we always say, <laughs> how do I go backwards? Uh, no, I don't know, anyway. How do I go to the last slide? Huh? I'm getting back. It's like, anyway, what I wanted to say, yeah? Can you, last slide? Last slide, yes. Where you, no, 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 it was yellow, it was Hebrew. Here, this is the one. Okay, all I wanted to say, the way they say, have, you know, be well or whatever, buy, whatever, it's a, continue to have a pleasant day. Hemshech Yom Naim to all of you. And thank you. Toda Rabba. Thank you very much. I think we have about uh, four minutes for Q&A. I think if you take into account some uh, lost time at the beginning. So we can take one or two questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have a one question about the new format of SAT. SAT? Yeah, new format of SAT. So, as you know, uh, many international students, especially Asian students, are very strong at mathematics and SAT sessions. So they almost got a higher score, it's almost the perfect scores, an 800, an SAT score. But since the uh, college board administered a new format of SAT last year, and many international students uh, got a much lower scores because they changed the format of mathematics. Yeah, question items. So the question items are in mathematics and use SAT got a long reading passages and attest their mathematical knowledge. So that's why they got, got um, great difficulties is getting a higher score and to get in uh, universities in the US. Do you have any suggestions or comments on that new format of SAT? I think it's a very good question, and I, just as we speak today, you know, Ofra, and we are trying to, we, our st Arab students fail the statistics always. <laughs> Obviously, the reason is they don't understand the things in Hebrew, and they fail it. For years, we've been saying, you know, give them the test in Arabic, you know. Now, they're changing it as we're talking about. Actually, the Ministry of Education introduced already multilingual tests based on the research I just showed you before now for immigrants. But what we found in this study is that students actually do perfect score when there are no words in math. But when it comes to those problems with words, they fail. You know, it's obviously the situation. And I think, you know, I think they have to change it. Now, in my mind, sometimes I think that policymakers know what they're doing. Maybe they don't want so many foreign students. <laughs> they know what we know. So I would, of course, put pressure and so on if it will help, but there is always an agenda, a bigger agenda by governments. Um, who knows? I don't want to blame ETS for that, but... Uh, <laughs> You always have to be suspicious because test is a very good tool for manipulation. But let's assume they are very sincere about it. They, I mean, that's not possible. You show them this research and others, there are a number of studies now, and the more we have, the better. There's a group in Belgium, there's a group in many places that are doing these kind of studies now. And um, hopefully this something, I mean, it's obviously language makes a difference here. Okay, we can take one more question. Yes, please. So, I 
I like your idea about not using multiple choice questions in <laughs> the university setting. So I've been fighting with my, I haven't been fighting, they've, I've been passive about it. So I don't do uh, testing at the university. I've been at my school for a year, but I was wondering, like how do you get these policymakers? So, so we're mostly teachers here, but how do we get the admin to understand these, like they ask me every two weeks, you gotta test the students. And I'm like, well, we are doing language learning through conversations and dialogue, and that's not really the written, like what yesterday, what Bill said, we are doing high-coded testing and low-coded speaking. So I'm just wondering, for policymakers, or just how do we get to be on the same page? Okay, obviously it's a fight, you know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I want to tell you, why did you think, if I think about it in terms of advocacy, how can we get this multilingual policy, multilingual policy in Israel? As of March 1st, we got funded for that. Uh -huh. We worked for 10 years on lobbying, I must say. For 10 years, really. We did conferences and so on and so on. I think you just have to come up with pressure, explain to them, and bring data. Yes. I always find that data is most important to show these things. Even now, with the example I just used now with the statistics, my, one of my colleagues, Ofro, I mentioned, she sent my article in 2011, which shows the same data I just showed you now about the two lines. Yes. So I think it takes a long time. I think one of the things that um, Bill said yesterday also is about the teacher is always wrong. You know, the teachers don't have the authority, unfortunately, but teachers have to request the authority. And, the, and okay, so there are lots of examples. Look at people with sign language. How come sign language is so big? I don't see here a signer, but in where many places where we go, there are signers and they're part of conferences now. This was a long way of, uh, somehow people think that language is not the same, language for hearing people is not the same. But we have to convince them it takes a long way, year, many years to learn a language and this, we need this kind of thing. But if you show them tests of students that are fla failed on a test, okay. regular test, multiples, and then they had to do a different type of activities and they did well, or in an interview they would do well it should be convincing. Of course, principles don't work alone. They have all those levels above them. So I think if there are people here in the audience who are kind of related to the government, it's time to think differently. And I want to tell you, you see this as a coming trend now, that people are thinking differently about assessment and using alternatives and trying to use different, especially when it comes to language, because there's no way multiple choice can get to any of these. Okay, thank you very much. This will conclude the plenary uh, session. Uh, now the uh, Kate Pride and Yang Lee come forward and then present a special. <laughs> okay, we have the, another wonderful presentation. It's really insightful and uh, informative and uh, also provocative. The presentation, short enough to sustain our interest, so we didn't have no chance to get bored, and uh, this present also long enough to maintain the subject, okay? So, uh, I'd like to give it enough. Right, okay. thank you. Right, can we take a picture? Okay. Okay. Oh. Two cameras, yeah. I don't know where to look. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. I think